Come on, baby. There we go. All right. Would you, uh, are you Dr. Dahan? Do we say that? Yes, you can say okay. that. Okay. <laughs> so it is Lee Dahan. And what is your title with respect to Kernza? I'm the lead scientist for Kernza domestication here at Glenn's Institute. Okay, it's wonderful. Can you kind of give us a brief history of Kernza's evolution to date? And I'm not talking about a 30 minute thing, I'm talking about 30 seconds. Yeah, uh, so uh, Kernza is a, was started as a, brought to the US as a forage plant to be used to feed cattle with the leaves and stems and some varieties were released over the years. Um, starting in the late 80s to 90s, um, an organization called the Rodale Institute began to look at increasing the seed yield to be able to use the seed of this plant as a food for humans directly, um, not just feeding the leaves and stems to cattle. That went on until about 2000. Um, here at the Land Institute, we, we took over that work beginning about 2001. Um, I, I dove into it in 2003 and uh, by 2010, that became my primary job here was to uh, increase the yield and seed size and other properties of this plant um, through breeding. And uh, that's been going on you know, ever since that. And in the last uh, seven years, I've uh, really focused on expanding collaborations with researchers around the country and around the world. We now have uh, people working at, with us in uh, Europe and Australia and Canada and around the United States on all aspects of this crop. Okay. Um, a little bit of yeah, history about me uh, so you understand where I'm coming from. I, we moved here in 1999. I wrote primarily just about commercial agriculture. Uh, they told me, oh, you know how to use a scoop shovel. You're now our new <laughs> agricultural expert. And boy, you know, I, I started from scratch. And when I came here, I knew nothing of the Land Institute. I knew nothing of West Jackson. So when I came, uh, you know, the, the, I learned a lot about what you were trying to do here. Uh, but the one thing that I knew, also knew that to achieve something as dramatic and, uh, as you guys are after, um, it takes time and things kind of appear from the outside that it moves at somewhat of a snail's pace. But now that I've spoken with Fred Utsi and uh, Rachel Strohr and now you, I mean, it's, I'm learning that there is some momentum and uh, the fact that you've hired a commercial, you're hiring a commercialization manager, that's what led me to do this story, to pursue this story. So that leads to my, uh, my third question. You've always struck me as somewhat reserved along with others at the Land Institute, but I've sensed some excitement recently from others regarding Kernza. Has your excitement ramped up any over the prospects of Kernza? Yeah, definitely. It's, it's fun to see the work that you've been doing you know, actually out in the field and um, hopefully starting to make a difference. And, uh, you know, that we, we sort of have this, uh, we're in the situation of something that farmers are growing on a small scale and yet we realize that a whole lot of work needs to be done. And so um, you know, I, I sort of remain focused on the work that needs to be done and the fact that uh, we're not uh, happy with the current yield, we're not happy with the current seed size, and we're not uh, happy with the lack of information that we can give farmers about how to best grow it. So we, I mean, I, I think I feel more of an urgency now because farmers that are starting to grow it and they really need answers, they need solutions, and they need better varieties to grow. So um, it's, okay. I, I mean, I, I think if there's anything that's exciting to us is being able to, to see a product on the shelf. I mean, I, that's, that's kind of the, the thrill for me uh, to be able to pop open a, a beer that's that's made with the grain that you developed. Um, that's very rewarding, and uh, be able to eat bread, um, see things in a restaurant um, being served that is the product of our work here. Um, that's been, I guess, sort of the, the big excitement for me. Okay. 
What can you talk a little bit about the key issues that serve as hurdles to cross on this journey to make Kernza break into the mainstream of uh, uh, commodities that are available? Yeah, uh, the, the research needs, as I was just saying, are, are really profound. Um, more that we don't know by far <laughs> than what we do have figured out. Um, and those, those are very practical things like that have been answered for hundreds or thousands of years for our crops. You know, when's the best time to plant it? And uh, how's the best way to harvest it? And uh, what kind of soil fertility does it need? Uh, very basic questions and those need answers. And so we need a research team to, to go after those. And am I, uh, pardon me for interrupting, but are we saying that we don't really have the answers, you're in the development I mean, of those answers right exactly. now? Exactly, so we have some uh, some early results indeed, and uh, in some cases we're giving farmers sort of our best guess, or we know what's worked in some places, but do we know what's best in this place? And um, so there, there just remains a whole lot that's unknown, and uh, those farmers that are growing are have to be a, the adventurous type, and uh, willing to take take on uh, something totally new and uh, you know, realize that they're, most of them are doing it because they're, they're excited about it and because they, they want to be a part of this, this new thing. Um, and they realize the state at which it's at right now. Part of the reason I wanted to write this story is because I, I yeah. want to have something to brag to my grandkids <laughs> about. But, uh, um, you know, and there's a there are a lot of question that, questions that I have sent Rachel, you know, uh, you know, uh, who is credited for the development. You've already uh, covered that. Um, uh, you know, how are you trying to improve it? We, you've you've talked about that. Uh, you know, what are the economics of Kernza? We're still trying to determine that, right? I mean, if you raise it now, what what can what kind of a return? Like you said, you've got to be the adventurous type. Yeah, yeah. Our, our I mean, really our goal in this is to make sure that farmers who are growing it have a way to have a an income from the land that's comparable to other crops they can grow. So, if the yield's much lower, they're going to have to have a much better price, of course. So, um, yields have been unpredictable and generally low so we have to uh, you know, treat it as, as a specialty crop right now and uh, we're trying to get beyond that and that that requires breeding and genetics you know that uh, those who work in in our existing crops make slow steady progress you know we have the ability to make a much faster progress because uh, we're still in the early phases of this work so we can increase the yield hopefully by 10% every year or two um, through breeding. And uh, yeah, I don't know how long that's gonna keep on going, but we keep, if we keep that kind of pace going, we'll be able to, to get the, the yields to the point where, where farmers can get a, a, a decent income while the consumer doesn't have to pay a crazy price. And right, right now, the consumer has to pay a pretty crazy price and um, that's why it's being used at 10 or 15 percent in a product that's out there. So mm -hmm. um, it makes sense to, to you know, make use of the unique flavor that comes out of it. And you don't need to have uh, 100 percent of the product being from Kerns in order to have you know, to really get what, that, that unique flavor. And what, how do you describe the flavor? What's bread taste like that it's made yeah, it's, with? A, I've had chocolate chip cookies made yeah. with it. And, and in something like cookies, it, it gets hidden by the fat and the sugar and the chocolate to the point where you can probably hardly notice that there's a difference. Um, it's, it's pretty subtle. Um, and something that brings out the flavor like a sourdough bread, um, the, the description that people like to publish is sweet and nutty. Um, okay. There's, <laughs> there is, a, as you bake it, there's a kind of a honey aroma that comes off, um, kind of a spiciness as well. Some of the products, the beer, people say has a, a spiciness to it that's, that's unique. Um, it's really just a flavor all of its own and, and you need to really taste it to, to understand it, I think. Not necessarily an acquired taste? No, it's, it's widely- It's subtle? Yeah. You know, uh, 
widely accepted. I mean, a lot of people really like it. So. Okay. Um, I've tried other, you know, specialty new things, and um, where you just have to kind of, you know, get through it. And, right. And so this, in this case, it, we can make delicious products. Um, you can also use it poorly, or if the grain is handled wrong, it might have a bad, you know, an off flavor. Um, but also uh, mixing it in a certain kind of recipe, um, it doesn't always come out right. So you have to learn how to use it. So in the right recipe, it's really good, uh, but it could be handled poorly as well. Uh, we are at, uh, I'm, I'm about a minute away from saying thank you. Um, questions, uh, will livestock eat it? Have you found out whether it's palatable? Yeah, so um, obviously, as I mentioned, this is a, it, it is cattle feed. That's why it was introduced to the United States. So mm -hmm. the plant has been used for cattle for. But the for seeds, the yes, yeah, so the seeds mm -hmm. themselves, um, there's really no question that it would be because, you know, okay, if, if humans find it okay, okay, livestock will will find it okay, okay. as well. Um, we haven't gone down the road of that research really that much because of, um, given the high price, you're not going to feed it to, to livestock. Okay. The only you know, the, the issue where you might want to look at that is if you had a field that got contaminated with some weeds and you couldn't get the weeds out and make it uh, swap it down. Yeah, and so bale it, so okay. bale it, or even take the grain and feed it to hogs or chickens. Okay. And so we're talking about that kind of research and, and trying to do a few studies about livestock use uh, in the future okay um, how do you harvest it I mean can you use a combine yeah uh, if you if the all, if all goes well um, if there was no not a severe weed issue or anything else um, then direct harvesting with a combine seems a good way to go oh. um, otherwise you can swap it as used to be very common with with small grains oats and wheat Okay. Used to swap it, let it dry a bit, and then harvest it. So okay. the, the stems can re and leaves can remain green, and so oh. um, you're trying to harvest up above the, the green and just take the ripe heads. Uh, if you're going to direct combine it, but if there's been any lodging, if it's fallen over, you can't really make that separation. So then you really have to take the whole thing, and that okay. that's best then to, to swap it, let it dry a little bit, and, okay. and then combine. Um, can it be stored in a grain elevator? Um, yeah, we haven't had so much that so we've had to put it in an elevator. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's we usually store it in, in bulk bag uh, totes that okay. farmers might get their seed in. Okay. And that kind of tote, a thousand pound totes. Okay. And at room temperature, it seems to be very stable. We're doing storage studies, so okay. does the grain go bad or does it get a bad flavor over time? And so far, the results have been good. That the, the grain is very stable. Um, flour is less stable, just as wheat is. If you start milling it, okay. a whole grain, uh, the, the oils can go rancid, at, especially at high temperatures. So, um, similar to whole grain wheat. Okay, um, we're done. All right, we're done. Thank you very much. Um,